Hi. Um, stabbed in the back by your own people. Um, no, I was going to say that um, from being on the shoot, the one thing that I kind of really noticed, it's something that Campbell said actually that I thought was really interesting, and that is that it's kind of harking on that depth of field comment, and that is that when you start shooting with stereo, you start using a kind of slightly different camera language. For example, like depth of field starts getting replaced by depth in the scene, so you're not using a depth of field as a depth cue anymore. You're kind of using, because you actually have the kind of spatial awareness when you're watching it. I was kind of sort of wondering if there's any other kind of things that you would consider to be kind of specific camera language kind of changes yeah, when shooting in stereo. It's interesting that, because a lot of people talk about 3D, and they, maybe not people who are particularly technical, and they talk about depth of field when they mean stereoscopic depth, and they get very confused between the two. Um, but I say, yeah, you can use depth of field as another tool. You have to use it, you know, with caution. Um, you have to be really, really give it a lot of attention, and ideally have a big um, 3D TV monitoring, so you can really get an impression of what it'll look like, rather than um, just sort of second guessing it from a, a small anaglyph monitor, for example. That actually helped loads on set. Yeah, you yeah, you had a 42-inch really JVC monitor. Yeah. In the, yeah. Um, I mean, other language. Um, I suppose one thing um, is, you know, d d term, uh, talking about how much depth you actually want in a particular shot. You know, the, often the common assumption is you want to use all the depth available in every single shot, and whether you want to dynamically change that within a shot. Um, it, it's strange because not a lot of people are, 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 com are comfortable enough on a 3D shoot now to start exploring the, the sort of creative elements of shooting. They just think maybe there's only one shot way of making this shot work in 3D, and there's just a is a scientific, you know, an algorithm that pops out the number at the end of it, but it's not. It's, it, it can be a really creative process, but not many directors and DPs are at that point now where they can treat it as a creative tool. They just sort of let a stereographer decide, and they can't have that dialogue yet. So I'd be, I'd be quite interested when we get to that point, and it's not far on the corner. Um, but yeah, a lot of the language is, is confused, and... Um, yeah, I think it, it think it's there's very few people who can look at a 3D image and critically sort of you know, analyze it and, and and say actually I don't like it for this reason, I don't like it for that reason. It's just almost if this is how it looks in 3D, and uh, they can't start exploring the options yet. But I'm sure that'll come surely. Cool, thanks. Uh, how well aligned did the cameras have to be, geometry and the focal length, and how do you check that on set? Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's several ways of checking it. I mean, you can obviously check it pre-shoot. You can be familiar with the lenses and camera bodies and everything else that you're using. Um, you, you can get away with, with different focal lengths. It's just going to compromise the final image quality. What you can't get away with is, say, the back focus being different on each lens and you, you focusing at different distances. I mean, you can get away with it, but it's, it's really not that, not that pretty. So can you give some idea of rule of thumb? Do you need to be right within one pixel out of the width or something like that? Well, once you've fixed it, you really need to get it, if you're fixing it in post, you need to get it bang on because um, you may be relying on only 1% of image width to give you your parallax into the screen, for example. So the furthest thing you can see, the, the difference in left and right image could be as little as 1% of the image width, and that can give you a remarkable sense of depth combined with the depth cues. Now, if you've got a focal length difference, that's 1% of the image width, it's going to completely throw out your 3D or any other you know, rotation or other you know, lens distortion can really, really... It's the problem with subtle 3D when we put loads of 3D and theme park style 3D into a shot, you could get away with small distortions, you could, you know, the overwhelming sort of 3Dness of the shot would still come through. But if you're dealing with subtle 3D, as most people now want to make, you, know, you really have to sort of fine tune it much more to and make sure that the whatever incorrections, imperfections you've got don't overwhelm the actual parallax that's giving the, the actual true depth of the scene. And it really is, I was just working on some of this natural history stuff, um, doing the, the corrections in online suite early this week, and it really, really can be it's tiny, tiny adjustments that just, you suddenly, suddenly, you suddenly adjust it and you can watch it in 3D and you, you kind of feel as a sweet spot and just pings and everything sort of comes to life. All the depth cues start reinforcing each other rather than fighting against each other. But it can be a tiny, tiny amount when you're dealing with subtle 3D. Hi, I was just thinking about delivering for different formats. And if you've got, um, if you're on a shoot and you're going to be delivering for cinema screen, 
and that's also going to be shown on television. Do you set your stereo for the larger screen, but then it won't be very much on the small screen? Or do you work towards the small screen, but then it might be a bit overpowering on the large? I suppose it depends. If it's a long form piece, then you definitely want to err on you know, the subtle side. So the, the rules of thumb for TV are positive inter-screen parallax, about 2%. And you'll see that now on, you know, on, on Sky's guidelines on their website. Um, so they've come up with this 2% figure, which people, most people agree with. And then for cinema screens, the consensus is about 1.5% of image width. So yeah, it, you really should shoot for the large screen, and then it'll look fine on the smaller screen. Okay, admittedly, you won't be using as much depth as you could possibly use on the smaller screen, but it'll look fine. But if it's a short form piece, you can push that definitely. If it's a commercial 30 second commercial, you can really push those. And I, I think people will want to push them as much as possible to get in you know, a high impact. If you've got things flying out of the screen or flying back into the screen, they can massively exceed that because they're only happening for a very short amount of time. Um, but if you're doing a three hour live opera transmission or something like that, you really want to keep it very, very subtle. Because the last thing you want to do is sort of hurt people's eyes. And what are your major deciding factors when <coughs> choosing a camera or choosing a system of cameras for a certain shoot? Well, I mean, if someone rings us up and says, I want to do a shoot on a particular camera, then if they've got a budget for us to spend, and we haven't shot on it before, for example, and uh, if, if we've got a budget for us to spend two days in prep, um, that's fine. We'll pretty much make most cameras work. You know, you've got to sort out how do I monitor on this camera, how do I play back, how do I get common time code, how do I gen lock the cameras. Then there's the grip issues. How do I actually physically mount this camera on a particular rig so that both cameras are the same height, particularly on mirror rigs. Um, and then you've got other issues to do with once we've got these cameras on, the lens you want and the follow focus systems, what can I physically mount it on? Is it going to mount on the steady cam that you wanted to use? Probably not. Um, will it fit on the, the remote head that you want to use? So each time you use, use a different camera, you've got all those things to go through. But that's becoming less painful now as you know more and more cameras have been used on existing rigs, so we know which combinations work. One, one addition to that, though, is if, if, if you do want to shoot, for example, sort of handheld or a steady cam, you are very limited to, to uh, particular cameras, and you, you'd have to make certain sacrifices in terms of the size of the cameras and size of lenses, and maybe even we've got mini mirror rigs that we use, but they, you, you lose the ability to pull focus and, and use longer lenses. Any further questions? Oh, one back. Um, just curious, how much does lens artifacts and chromatic aberrations and lens flares affect uh, what kind of lenses you choose and affects the depth cues? Affects the depth cues. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, I mean, th there's all sorts of lens aberrations that you don't notice in 2D that suddenly become apparent in 3D. Uh, we've shot a lot uh, of broadcast stuff with you know, um, ENG lenses, and they're all over the place. You know, you get lenses with sort of anamorphic squeezes in that are very, very subtle that you never see in, in 2D, but suddenly throw everything out in 3D. Uh, lens flares, yeah, they're, they can be, occasionally they look beautiful in 3D and they just work in 3D space. More often than not, though, they they look very different in each eye and they don't work. But if they're very you know, fleeting, then you can live with them. Um, yeah, so it, it depends. And um, if we're doing live stuff, then it's obviously very important. Um, but sort of chromatic aberrations and things like that, there's, there's more and more tools, um, as I'm sure you'll hear later, that can sort of fix those automatically or semi-automatically. Any other questions? Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Andy. No problem.